Good morning. Everybody doing good? Yeah, so far? Good. I feel like I haven't been here for ages. I haven't. Thank you, whoever said that. You can always depend on the body of Christ to encourage you. <laughs> Open your Bibles with me this morning. I've got something I just wanted to share with you, and then we can go about our lives with the Lord. Matthew 11, your iPhones, iPads, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> lately, the Lord's been showing me a lot about this thing called nature, and uh, it's really rocked my world. It's really starting to change me of how I'm supposed to walk, how I'm to walk, the way I'm supposed to walk. I'm not supposed to be a, just a, be a follower of Jesus, but I'm supposed to become like him. There's a difference. The enemy would love for us just to follow him, not become like him. Let me say that one more time. The enemy would love for us to just follow him, but not become like him. Uh, when you become like him, that's when you start changing your environment. It, it not only changes you, but it also changes every person you come in contact with. It's not what you say, it's how you say things. You can speak the truth, you can read this Bible publicly all day long, but not have love. You can't, you can't change people. Because this has got to first manifest in us. The word wants to be made manifest in the flesh again through the body of Christ. And he was the first forerunner of this thing. That's why he is the, he's the first fruits of many brethren, the Bible says. And the things that he would say, if you really look at Jesus' life from, you know, if you're, he's the fishbowl and you're outside his fishbowl, you look at Jesus' life and the things he said was kind of strange. Because all, the only thing he would speak is parables. The seed falls to the ground and die and bideth alone. And then he'd talk about all kinds of agriculture, you know. He'd talk about agriculture and people would start getting it. They would start going, oh my gosh, that's this. And some would go, oh my gosh, what is he talking about? But if you look at how he, how he spoke and the things he shared, it wasn't necessarily he was trying to get them to get what he's sharing he's trying to get those that would actually see him to catch the spirit of it and if you catch the spirit of what of what he was saying then it changes you have you ever been around someone that has spoken into your life but it's not you're not worried about what they speak it's just being around them causes you to change i've sat with uh a spiritual father of mine for years and I, I couldn't wait to get to his house and I could care less what he said it's just being there when he would speak I knew it would change me because there was so much love that would come out of him as he's speaking and then he'd look at me and say do you get that and I and when I was younger and didn't really know this I'd go oh yeah I got it and I was listening for to the information instead of the spirit but I didn't understand that yet I I, I know now that was God in in flesh manifesting to me trying to get me to actually get it which was Bob Jones to me my spiritual father was like Jesus in a man suit to me but I didn't get it until he left Same thing with Jesus, you know. They didn't really get it until he left. And when he left, they realized, oh my gosh. We had been sitting around the throne the whole time. Because Jesus is the throne. He is the mercy seat. You get around him, everything is judged in your heart. He doesn't even have to say anything. His love exposes everything, doesn't it? And you get around certain people, it's not what they're saying that makes you a little bit nervous. It's who they are. Amen? So he wants us to be like him on earth as he is in heaven. He could care less us talking like him. 
He wants us to be like him, which will totally rock the world. It'll change the world. It'll change your world up here as well. I guarantee you. At first, there'll be major warfare when you start seeing this nature start to wake up in you, and that warfare is going to be in your own mind. Because when you st love starts awakening you, the very thing that happens is your carnal mind starts rebuking it. It starts reminding you of your, of your past. It starts telling you you've got too much shame to enter into this place. It makes all of these excuses. And then the religious spirit comes in and says, hey, you've got this stronghold. You need to deal with it. You need to go do... But it's still the same old thing. It's the old carnal mind. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. Put your hand right here. The carnal mind is enmity with God. So it's always going to accuse God 24 hours a day. Oh, please get that one. Because there's so many of us that will go through your day subconsciously, your carnal mind is always arguing about your old personal nature. Oh, you remember you used to do this, and my gosh, you need to get rid of this. And, and all day long, you just hear this bombardment. I wonder, have you ever wondered why? Because you don't realize when you gave your heart to the Lord, that was like the Red Sea parting and you went to the other side and it's no longer you living, it's Christ in you that's living. But the enemy that's on the other side is yelling at you, trying to get you to look at your old nature and not, instead of seeing your new nature. People say, I want breakthrough. We forget that we got breakthrough when we accepted Jesus Christ. That's your true breakthrough. Because now we have the divine nature to overcome anything that comes at us. Anything. It's like we've got an atomic nuclear bomb inside of us and we don't even, we feel like we've got a, a firecracker. And it's just going to snap every now and then and make a loud noise and it'll never change anything. But an atomic bomb will change everything. It'll change the whole reason if you, region if you drop it. And the atomic bomb just comes, it's not saying anything, it just drops and it explodes and it changes geographics and everything. It never had to, as it was coming down, saying, I rebuke the trees and all this ground to give me, it, the power that is within it changes the geographics. The power that is within you, it's not your, just your mouth that changes things. The power that is within you, if you'll ever let it wake up, it will change geographics, and you won't even have to say a word. Your life will say it. How many of you are tired of being followers? That's a trick question. Who's making us think this way? Because then it gets you into trying to be, be all this behavioral stuff. How about just being? What if you have all the divine nature that's in you when you, you accepted Jesus Christ? Because when you accepted Jesus Christ, he didn't just say, I'm going to give you 10% and you're going to have to work out the rest of the 90. If you're believing that, we're under a religious lie. The very people you don't like are the very ones that God has sent in your life to actually love. Because he knows that you have the love for that particular person. Now the other person that's next to you may not have that type of love with that person, but you do. That's why you get these oddballs that are sent into your life that you cannot stand. They're the first, they're the very reflection of the carnal mind's voice that is always bombarding you and telling you how ugly you are. So you've already got some power there. You've overcome the way it's talking to you. Now that person that's manif that manifests in your life that you've overcome in your own mind is now there to actually be set free. When I got set free of anger, guess how many people I got that were angry? That were just furious. 
They had major religious problems and religious spirits, and they were always debating me. And, and finally I woke up. I said, Lord, why are you sending these? Because He said, because they, this is the very thing you overcame. Now you have love for these people. And I'm like, I do. Because <laughs> you forget. And man, the enemy wants us to forget who we really are. We want to forget who he really is. Because we're more focused on ourselves than him right now. And man, if we ever get back focused and start seeing who he really is, it, start cha- it starts awakening that divine nature in us, and we start loving without having to even do it. You just start obeying because obeying is wonderful. Now, in this world, it doesn't seem wonderful because it's given a, given a bad rap. But obeying is awesome. If you obey him, you love him. Those that love him truly obey him. They obey his commandments and walk in it. And you eventually love obeying. And it becomes a part of your life. You eventually start obeying love than you are your own self-will. When you love to love others more than yourself, when you like to get to that place to where your whole life is to give life even while someone's in major sin. Christ died for us even yet while we were in sin. In other words, he loved you even while you're in sin. Even if you weren't going to change, he still was going to love you. He never changed. He never looked at us and said, well, I'm going to die for you. Now you've got to change. No, he just said, I want to die for you. Even if you don't change. That's how much I love you. And that's the type of life that's going to wake up in this nation. We're getting so selfish that God's about to wake up. Okay, praise the Lord. Matthew 11 We're going to start in verse 29. Now I want to preface this. We've got to remember that what he is about to say, he is speaking in an atmosphere of Roman control and torment. And he's also speaking in the atmosphere of religious, churchy, terrible control of the people. The religious church has gotten to the point to where they're using God's principles to control people. And now you've got a bunch of wounded sheep out there, and you've got a bunch of wounded people out there that are wounded by the government. So it's either the church or the government that's wounding them. Sound familiar? Won't get into political stuff because I can, I just hold my tongue. But... This place that they're in, spiritually, that they're, everybody's living in spiritually, God has allowed to get so bad so that everybody can truly see the light. One little light appeared, and everybody can recognize it. Oh, my goodness, that's light. Why? Because it's, everything else is dark. Oh, my God, that man is totally different than anybody else. We've never seen a man like this. And he's about to share this to people that are in bondage. Now let's just read this and hear what he's actually saying. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. In other words, just watch me. If you'll watch me, you'll change. Have you you ever been around somebody long enough that their nature gets off on you whether it be good or bad y'all right you don't have to say the bad ones but we do do that we're the only ones that can actually be transformed in the very image that we're beholding nobody else can do it only we can which is wonderful even the angels are wonder how in the world does that happen And he's saying, if you'll look at me, instead of looking at all the stuff that's in your life and learn from me, all of the, everything, every burden that you've been carrying will become light. Every yoke that's been upon you 
will be easy if you just keep your eyes on me. That's what he's about to say. Because he first says, learn from me. Underline that. Un it says, learn from me, for I am, now you want to underline this, because this is who he is in you. For I am gentle. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, your minds. When you like to find rest for your mind, when you love to be so focused on the Lord that is within you that your mind comes into order with the very nature of God that's been hidden. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, this was, an, this was a huge statement in this atmosphere. Nobody is saying this. Nobody is saying, hey, I'll give you my life. I'm easy. I'm gentle. I want to help you. Just follow me and you'll change. I'll be with you. I'll never forsake you. The other atmosphere is saying, you've got to do this in order to be this. Right? You've got to bring a dove to the sacrifice or your sins are not forgiven. Or, and they were abusing all of that. The tax collectors taking taxes. You imagine the abuse that was going on. Now here comes a man that says, hey, here's what real life's about. This is who I am. So the people that are in the crowd that have been following him, they're probably whispering, you're, you're not going to believe this, but he really is like that. We've been watching him. And those that have never followed him, the newbies, the ones that have been following him, they don't realize it's gotten on them. So they start whispering to everybody in the crowd saying, this is the truth. You, uh, let me tell you a story of what happened yesterday. Everything he's saying, he's living. So the very nature that was on Jesus got on the ones that were following him, and then they started spreading it as he's speaking. You see, when you start changing, you can't help but talk. When you start really, the nature of God starts getting on you, you want to tell someone that doesn't follow him how wonderful he is. You don't want to tell people how bad they are and how much sin they've got in their life. You're, you're so excited to tell everybody about, man, you're not going to believe this guy I know. I've been following him. He is really gentle. Yesterday, you're not going to believe what happened. These lepers called out to him, and you can't call out. We got more revelation from the lepers than we did Jesus. They knew, they, they knew that they could break the atmosphere of the law and cry out to the Lord, hey, have mercy upon us. If it's your will, you can make us clean. That wasn't supposed to happen. But when you've got a reputation of someone that cares, you break all laws. You break all those hard laws that have been keeping you captive in your mind. That gives you disease like leprosy to where your body starts falling apart, your life starts falling apart. How many of us deal so, so many voices of those laws saying you got to do it this way, if you don't do it this way, you got to do it this way. If you don't, you're, you've got so much shame in your life, you've got to go to Christ this way and you've got to get this kind of deliverance, you got... And before you're while you're doing it, and even after you're doing it, you're frustrated. Anybody been here been in a ditch? Anybody in here that where you've been in a ditch and you rightly so needed to be in the ditch because you dug it? And you put yourself there, and when you put yourself there through your own sin. Then the enemy comes in and the carnal mind then really comes after you and still go and goes, see there, you dug your own ditch, you're in your place, you've got problems, you've got this issue, and it starts arguing even louder. Why? Because God's coming. 
Oh. And then this guy, someone shows up in your life that doesn't say anything about your ditch or what you dug it with and says, hey, come on with me. You're going to be all right. Have you ever had anybody say that? At the very point that you know you, you're expecting someone to knock you over the head with a shovel, the guy actually hands you a reward. Hey, you're going to be all right. Let's keep going. What did that feel like? Did it feel like that old carnal mind that says you deserve this? Or did it feel like, my gosh, you mean I don't have to think this way? You mean you can just reach down your hand and just pull me out and not say a word of what I did to get there? Yeah. It's the religious spirit that wants to pull you out and then remind you of all the things that you did. Okay. And they're beholding this, the man. This man's name has a reputation. The reputation is in Proverbs, if you want to write it down, reputation is in Proverbs 18.10. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and are safe. Interesting. Everybody ran to him. When they knew who he was, when they felt his spirit, when they, that reputation, when he'd come into town, everybody would come out of the ditches running to this man as though he's a tower and a safe refuge. And they didn't realize as they're running, they're becoming righteous. Because in their mind, they already know he's kind and lovely, which is changing them as they're running to the tower. That's why the lepers, 10 lepers got healed. They looked at him, and he said, hey, go show yourself to the priest. And they've already looked at him, and as they're running, they're changing because they beheld the tower. It was what was going on within them that was changing the outside. That's why he could say, go show yourself to the priest, because they didn't realize while they're beholding the tower they were being transformed right there. He was already saying, hey, you're already clean, go show the priest. But they didn't know it. God's that powerful. That's how strong he is. He didn't have to say one, not one word to those ten lepers. Or did he? was his life saying everything in their consciousness while they were beholding him. You look in somebody's eyes that truly loves you, I guarantee you, you start transforming inside. And you don't even know it. Leprosy starts falling off of you. All the things that have eaten up your life, if you look into the eyes of those that love you, changes you. You start forgetting your badness. And the accuser of the brethren that's been in your head starts to disappear because the nature of Jesus has rebuked it. Turn over to Mark 2. Does this help? I remember when I was in a ditch. I've been in a ditch a few times. says a righteous man will fall seven times but he gets back up so I already know I'm in for it if you're trying to not fall you've already fallen okay praise the Lord you hear that you're already in bondage God wants you to live life not analyze it He wants you to live with him, for him, in him, and become just like him. It's funny, when you're with someone you love, you never ponder your past. 
you think about it. It's like you can do everything, anything, and you're bulletproof. But the moment you're out of love is the moment you start articulating everything. You analyze everything. You even start seeing your partner different. Well, I, I didn't see that about him. It's because you fell out of love. Well, it's not a marriage counseling. Okay, Mark, Mark 2. Mark 2, verse 1. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I've studied this, I don't know how many times. And the, the other day I was looking into it because he told me to turn there. He said, I want you to look at me again. That's what he said. I want you to look at me again. I said, where? He said, Mark 2. And I thought, I know that scripture. <laughs> you ever done that? Well, I know what he's saying. And you just lean on something old he said. I know what he's saying. And you miss it. Y'all okay this morning? Yeah. We all right? All right, Mark 2. It says, and again, say again. again. And again, he entered Brad's town. I mean, Capernaum. <laughs> he entered Capernaum again. Say that with me again. again. How many times has he entered your house again? How many times has he come into your city again? Right? Capernaum was a busy place. It also had a lot of idols. And he comes again, doesn't he? He's coming again. <laughs> and after some days, it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately, many gathered together. So his reputation is now out that he's at his rent house. And... Everybody knows, if he's there, I'm going. So everybody knows that he is gentle, lowly in heart. If you get around him, you'll find rest. If you get around him, you won't have all those heavy stuff on you. It's weird, man. If you get around Jesus, if you're just around him, you're okay. If I'm just in his presence, I'm okay. And you just run to him. And you could care less who's next to you because they pile up in his house. To, can you imagine piling up in the house together? So they all are running to him because of this nature that he's exuding. And they all are piling in his house to where you can't even get in. So there is body odor. There's a lot of smelly stuff going on, but when you're in love or you're trying to be close to Jesus, you could care less what anybody smells like. Oh, your senses, your senses go toward the Lord instead of toward criticism. You start losing the earthly smells and the discernments that you've had to pick out critical things, and the only thing you can see is the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. And so they're gathered together. Say that with me. They're gathered together. That kind of reputation is about to hit the earth again, and we're going to start gathering together. And it doesn't matter if you're a heathen. It doesn't matter if you're a sinner. It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're a jihadist. It doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist. It doesn't matter if you're a religious person. It doesn't matter if you're a Catholic. It do All things will disappear. It disappears because you don't see the Lord going, oh, well, uh, check him, Peter. He just came in. He's got a bomb strapped to him. Because there's no telling how many times I've been a terrorist where I've walked into a meeting to actually set a bomb off. And as soon as the Lord shows up, it's defused. How many of you have been a terrorist for Jesus? <laughs> I wasn't expecting for him to say all this, so y'all can blame all this on him. <laughs> Immedi immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, 
not even near the door. Can you imagine what that smelt like? And he preached the word to them. Then they, say they. It didn't, didn't, he's, it's not one person. It says it, the story's about to shift. He, it shifts from, it's the strangest thing. It shifts from focusing on Jesus. Now Jesus wants the focus to be on these men. Oh, you got to get it. Because the author's doing this on purpose. He's, about, he's, he's telling you, okay, I, I want to tell you what Jesus is like just by letting you know how many people gathered into his house. But I want you to see Jesus in what's about to happen. So the whole story is basically, most of it is about these four men and a paralytic. But in that, Jesus is revealed. <laughs> That's what God is wanting. He's wanting to people to see Jesus in people instead of in Him. Because He's already done His part. Now His part, His other part, and His inheritance that He's left you in you has now got to show the rest of who Jesus is. He's leaving it up to man to show who Christ truly is on the earth. Are you with me? And he says this, And they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So these group of men get this idea, man, let's go take this guy to Jesus. And they all get together, and they grab him up, and they start hauling him to Jesus' house. Now, can you imagine the attitude that was on these four men? It's not what they were doing. It's, it was how they were doing it, how they carried him there. They were probably telling him what Jesus was like as they were going there, Tell, encouraging him, hey, it's going to be okay. We're going to get you in this house. You're not going to believe it. As soon as you look in his eyes, everything's going to change. Something's going to happen. And the, and the paralytic go, why? Because he goes, look at us. We're caring for you. We love you so much. We're here to actually go get the lost sheep, that one lost sheep, and bring him to the Lord. Because we love you, man. It doesn't matter how twisted you are. We're going to love you right where you are. And see, what happens when you start loving someone that's twisted up, it, it releases breakthrough to have an audience with Jesus. Could care just be the antidote for this world? Could kindness be an antidote? For viper poisoning of the religious spirit. I believe so. Because they're carrying this guy with the same, they don't realize it. The same natures that have been on them following Jesus, they, you know they've been following Jesus because they know exactly where to take him. They know where he's at. So they've been beholding Jesus. Now that nature is on them. Now the paralytic, while he's laying there in this little cot and they're carrying him, he's having to look at men that care, but he doesn't realize he's beholding Christ as in a mirror. And if you behold Christ as in a mirror, you are... So on his way to the Lord, the Lord's changing him through mankind. I've been looking for the Lord to change something. You do it, Lord. And the Lord goes, no, you do it. I've given you the very divine nature of who I am. Why don't you let it wake up and stop blaming me to do it? You love like I do because it's in you. Lose your criticism, lose all your judgment, and you'll be free, Brad. You'll be free to love anyone. You'll be free to love the most twisted up people. You'll stand for them. 
You'll mediate for them. You'll give your life for them. There's no greater love than giving your life to your brother or your enemy. So they're bringing him. Say they're bringing him. And you can imagine the power that's exuding out of these four men as this paralytic is watching them. And they're bringing the paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near, the, near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. There's that breakthrough. The way we care for people, the way we love them, creates breakthrough for them. I know this because I've experienced it. If you've been in a ditch and somebody cared for you when they're not really supposed to, you have breakthrough in your soul. That was my visitation from the Lord. I cried out to the Lord and he heard my cry. And he came. He came in a man. And when he came in a man and cared for me, even while I was in the ditch, I could, I knew this was Jesus. I knew this was the answer that I'd been crying out for. I need your help. And he gave me rest for my soul. You got to understand, Jesus is just a carpenter. We look at him as the son of God, but everybody else is looking at this, this kind carpenter that is awesome. He's going to accept you just the way he is. He's a carpenter, and it, it's the weirdest thing. He does miracles, but he's still a carpenter. I don't understand it, but I love him. There could be plumbers in here. There could be, you know, businessmen in here. There could be all types of stuff. That's just the vehicle to release Jesus. Now watch this. Watch this. So they're uncovering the roof. They're creating breakthrough. The very way that they're caring for him is creating breakthrough. So, when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Now watch this next line. And when Jesus saw, not his faith, he saw, he saw the faith of Christ waking up in a group of men. You could say when he saw their nature as they're beholding, bringing down this paralytic, he's looking at the paralytic and he's getting excited. He's, he's excited because it's already on them, but now as it's coming down and Jesus finally gets a glimpse, he sees the paralytic and he's already changing. That's why he calls him son. He had been transforming because he was with a group of men that was radiating the nature of God before they even got an audience with God. And so Jesus will confirm that which is going on in heaven coming upon the earth, and he'll say, Son, you've already been forgiven. Your sins have already been forgiven. The way you've been thinking about yourself has already been forgiven. You've already been transformed right now, and you don't even know it. Do you get it? Look at this. When he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, what do you call him? Son. You hang around a bunch of good folks that are exuding Christ. You're beholding the Lord. And you don't even know it. Even the disciples didn't know they were beholding the Father and they were being transformed into His likeness and didn't even know it. Who told us that we even have to know that we're being transformed anyway? Why can't you just actually enjoy just walking with the Lord or walking with each other? How'd you like to walk with each other with not having to analyze one another? Wouldn't that be awesome? Just that would actually free us. 
Because they're, they're, they're coming, they, they get to a point in their life with him, they go, Lord, show us the Father. It is sufficient for us to, show, to see the Father. Please show us. And he goes, have I not been with you so long you can't see me? In other words, this carpenter was actually the Father. And the Father inside that carpenter had been speaking to them their whole life, these all those three and a half years, and they couldn't see it. How many times have we not seen it when someone comes in our life and they speak something in your life, it changes you, and you don't even know. The Father has come down to actually reveal himself to you. And it transformed your life. You didn't realize it, but you were standing before the mercy seat. It was Christ in that person giving you the hope of glory for your life. Because Christ in us is the hope of glory. It's not Christ in him. It doesn't say Christ in him. It says Christ in here, in us, is the hope of glory. So Christ in these four men was giving this paralytic hope again, and it was transforming him without him even knowing. And by the time he got an audience with Jesus, Jesus just confirmed what's going on. You're a son. You were twisted up, but you've been, you've, been, you've been beholding me this whole time getting here, and it made you, what? Untwisted. Hang around people that are with Christ. You'll get untwisted. You won't have to go to the lines for prayer. You won't have to Facebook, I need deliverance. You just get around the right people that are exuding Christ, you get untwisted. They'll challenge you. I remember being around Bob. Man, I, sometimes when I'd go to Bob's, I, he, there would be that spirit on him that was the fear of the Lord. I'd walk in there, and I, I'd pucker up. Just like, oh, man. I, but, you know, y'all ever done that? Gotten nervous around certain people that are godly? I mean, really godly. Those that are real true, you know, you know, there's real believers and then there's unbelievers. Because a un- true unbeliever, you do realize, a true unbeliever, Paul, Paul talks about, a true unbeliever is a Christian that do- isn't walking with God. That's a true unbeliever. It's not a heathen, that's an unbeliever. And it says... And he said to this, this, this guy, can you imagine how excited Jesus was when he saw this guy? Are y'all here? Can you, y'all, this is awesome. Jesus actually gets excited. Can you imagine, how'd you like for God to be standing there and look at you when you've been all twisted up and you've been walking, but you've been hanging around a, a lot of men or women that have been walking with the Lord and you still feel like you haven't changed, and it, it gives you an audience with the Lord, and then the Lord walk up to you and go, what do you say, daughter of God? Do you think that rocked your world? Because God's excited. He's going, oh, my gosh, it's working even before my death. Oh. It's working. So he looks at him and goes, son. Your sins are forgiven. He could care less what he had been doing. It really what he had been doing was, have you ever been twisted up? What kind of mind do you have? Jenna, even, I've watched Jenna, I've known her for, I've known her for years now. I mean, she, she, there's times where she gets down on herself, and it's not about her body, it's about the mind. You start looking at yourself through the carnal mind, you get more twisted up here than you do your own bones. And he's looking at a, the man is still twisted up, but but it doesn't matter how twisted up he is in his body, it's in his spirit that he says, you're a son. And as he says it on the earth and he confirms what's going on in the heavens, which is within him, he's looking at within the heavens, which is in man, and he's going, you're now a son And when he says that, it confirms it on the earth, and his body has to start moving. 
because it has to line up with the way that he's thinking of himself. Your sins are forgiven. What sins? The old carnal mind that's been twisted him. Looking on the outward. Judging him. You must have done something bad. Your parents must have sinned. Something must have happened. You need to go back in your bloodline and cut it off. He got twisted up to become a son. Okay, praise the Lord. And then it says, here goes, and some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Y'all ever done this? Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God? And there's, there's God standing right, there's God, literally a carpenter, standing there with a hammer in his hand. Just look at, you know, a hammer in his hand going, hey, look at this guy, and he's a son. And I would probably would have reasoned that. How dare he forgive sin? But at the end of Jesus' life, he gives the disciples power to forgive sin. Why? Because they're like him. That statement was not for just a commandment. It was a wake-up call. They all cried and probably bawled their eyes out when he said, if you, if you forgive sins, they're forgiven. If you retain them, they're retained. They probably just dropped to the ground and said, oh, my God, we've become like you. Had nothing to do with the, the, art, the, the job that you've got to do. It had everything to do with he was actually telling them, okay, you were like that paralytic, but because you've walked with me, now you're untwisted. Now you can forgive sins because you're like me. You have beheld me long enough that you have been transformed into my likeness. And you will want to forgive them. And these reasoning guys are beholding this stuff and God is letting it go on. I mean, how many times have you heard a speaker or somebody that's really speaking the truth and your, your mind goes nuts and it's reasoning, but God still just keeps pouring it out while you're reasoning because if he can get you still beholding him as that speaker is speaking, you are being transformed in his likeness both through the power of the Spirit, not your power, through the power of the Spirit. And that's what's happening here. Even though they're reasoning, God is still faithful to love them where they are. I love this because he says, who can, he says, why, why does this man speak blasphemies? They start reasoning and he says, immediately when Jesus perceived in this spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, now at this point, I used to think, oh, he's going to get them. No, he's thinking, how can I actually help them? Remember, he's gentle. He's l What? Lowly, so he goes lower. He doesn't go higher to make himself lord over them. He perceives their minds of what's tormenting them and twisting them up. So he lowers himself so that they can see the gentleness of God. And in his spirit, they reasoned thus within themselves. And he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? Now watch this. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins. In other words, so that you can be free, I'm going to show you who I really am. I'm going to do what you want me to do. So they didn't want him forgiven sins. So he thought, well, I'll just lower myself so that you can actually see God again. I'll lower myself and I'll just go over here and go, uh, then get up, take up your pallet and just, just get up. So it wasn't just for him, it's for those that were reasoning. You think that brought conviction? Now, he didn't do it to show off. 
like most, well, yeah. He didn't do it to show off. He did it to save. Because these were his people. They were just as twisted up as the paralytic. And so watch how he handles this guy, these people. And he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. So the guy goes, okay. And it says, immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were what? They were, underline the all. They all were amazed and glorified God. He saved the whole crew. I would have done the miracle to the paralytic and turn to the reasoners and go, Man, you've got a religious spirit. Y'all got to repent. I'm going to tell you what. You're reasoning in your mind, and I know exactly what you're thinking. Man, God's in this house, and the fear of the Lord. I mean, no, what he was doing and the way he was treating them what released the fear of the Lord. You have somebody that loves you when you're, you're, you, you just know you're not supposed to be loved. It releases the honor of God in your heart. It's called the fear of the Lord. It changes you. And then the whole house got saved. Wouldn't you like to see your whole house get saved? Not just the twisted up things that the way that you think, but all that reasoning that goes on in your mind. Well, what about that? I just can't believe she's doing that. Why is he speaking that way? And I would do it this way. The Bible says, aren't you tired of that? Wouldn't you like to meet a carpenter that's the son of God? Wouldn't you like to see him lower himself and meet you right where you are and blast your heart to where you no longer think through your head, but you think through your heart? Everybody became the nature of God after that day. And he spread throughout the regions. How did he spread throughout the regions? Through men, through women. That's how we're going to spread him. It's not by talking him. It's by living him. Does this make sense? Let me pray for us. Lord, I just thank you for this Sunday. Thank you for all the things that have gotten us up to get us here. You'll allow all things to happen for our good. We love you. Lord, if it takes others to get us in your face, so be it. Bring them. But I pray, Lord, that the divine nature of Jesus would awaken in all of us. That we would start beholding you instead of this world. We'd stop taking on the image of this world, but take on the image of God. I pray, Lord, that anybody in this room that has been dealing with some messed up thinking, let the anointing of the love of God that's in this room Blast their house. Blast their minds and fill them with your glory. Because it doesn't matter how twisted up their mind is. It doesn't matter what they've done. You just don't want to tell them, just get up and let's go. Wow, there it is. Just get up and let's go. You can leave it right here. You no longer have to figure it out. You no longer have to figure out how much sin you're in or try to measure yourself. Just get up and just start walking with me. That's all. Let the Lord show himself to you in a way you've never even seen him before. Let him sh show you his gentleness. Let him show you his kindness. He goes low so that he can bring you high. 
His report about you in heaven is awesome and good. Let it come into your heaven, into your body, and into your spirit. And let that which has been taking over your life to only twist you up, be left alone wanting because you've left it to follow another mind, Christ Jesus. Paul said, let this mind be in you. He didn't say, I'm going to make this mind be in you. He said, let this mind. So I just, I just urge you to let go of whatever's been in you, the mind that's been in you that's criticized you, and let the mind of Christ let the mind of his love and his care come in your life and fill you with his glory because it doesn't matter how twisted up you are he calls you son or daughter it doesn't matter what you've done in your life in his mind you're his the only thing that requires of us is just to agree to it Agree to what he says instead of what your sin says, instead of what your mind says, instead of what they say. Agree to what the voice of the Father says to you. And let it create breakthrough within your soul. And you'll find rest. You'll walk out of shame and just start following Jesus. You may have sinned yesterday, but you'll be like David. When David sinned and killed a man to lay with a woman, then death was, was birthed into his life. After the death was over, he just shook himself off and went back to the throne and started doing what God called him to do. If there's any type of breakthrough you need today, some of you in this room, is to get up and start walking in your calling. Just get up. Just start walking. Shake off yourself like David did. Now, there'll be a lot of soothsayers There'll be a lot of people that say you've got to walk through this and you've got to walk through that. They don't realize you do walk through this and walk through that when you start walking in your calling. When you start walking in the, that divine love and nature for your life. Now break every sickness, every spirit of infirmity that has hound our body, that has hound our mind. We break it in this room. We break it off the people that were watching. No longer will this spirit of infirmity and torment hit your body any longer. We let the mind and the, the presence of Jesus now to replace it. Where there was infirmity, there's glory. So fill those places of infirmities with your glory, Lord, right now this morning. And let healing arise. And let it command whatever's there to leave. Every form of shame that, have that has talked to you. Let the Lord walk in on that house and let him sit on that throne of shame and just watch what happens. He turns shame into a throne of God because shame disappears. Let him enthrone himself on your very secret place that you've hidden. Let him come to your secret places. A 
I just welcome you, Lord, into my secret places I've been ashamed of. Enthrone yourself here. Let us get up. Let us arise. Take up that thing that's been controlling us, and now we control it. For we arise into your nature and walk with you. We love you, Jesus. Let that that you have given us that has been hidden in man for so long, that mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory, let it start arising. Let it take over our life. Let it take over this world. Let not just four men be carrying paralytics. Let us all be carrying paralytics. Let us all be known as those that carry the twisted ones. And I pray for every person that gets in their car when they leave this today to protect their children, protect their cars, protect their family. And Lord, I ask that every need that they need right now, every family that's in, in a place of need, Lord, I ask that if you could rain bread and send quail from heaven, Lord, you can send it to these families that are in need. Lord, there are some families that have just been bickering, maybe in this audience, and, and those that have been uh, maybe watching, and you feel like because you've been complaining, you're not going to get anything. Well, I'm going to tell you what, God's bigger than your complaining. He'll send quail. He'll fill you up till you can't even walk. Lord, I ask that. Show them how wonderful you want to be for their life. Supply to them their every need in Christ Jesus. We ask that in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, love you guys. Get up and hug somebody. Get a paralytic in your hand. Because <laughs> we're all that. Amen? Amen. Grace, grace.